Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started now. I'd like to introduce Craig w Williamson. Uh, Craig is an um, Ohio eminent scholar of ecosystem ecology at Miami University in Ohio, where he leads the Global Change Limnology Laboratory. His expertise is the ecology of UV radiation and climate change, with a current focus on effects of water priority on ecosystems. His research is based at Lackawack San Sanctuary and Biological Field Station in northeastern Pennsylvania, but extends worldwide. Research questions range from UV effects on the ecology of zooplankton, larval fish, infectious diseases, to deploying advanced sensors to decipher sentinel responses of lakes to climate change. He serves on the United Nations Environmental Program, Environmental Effects Assessment Panel, is active in Global Lake Ecology Observing Network, also known as GLEON, where he leads the Climate Sentinels Working Group and is Chief Scientific Advisor of the Pocono Lake Ecological Observing Network, an outreach program on public education and monitoring of lakes in northeastern Pennsylvania. This is Craig's second trip to Glural. Uh, Craig worked with me in 1984 on zooplankton. He's extended his uh, uh, research to global change. I'm still working on zooplankton. Uh, Craig will be working with uh, some of our US academ USGS academic and global colleagues to investigate uh, UV effects on the Great Lakes. And the question we have in the Great Lakes region here is, have increases in water clarity also occurred in the UV range, and are there any impacts? Uh, with that, uh, uh, Craig Williams. Thanks very much, Hank, and thank you all for coming today. This is a real uh, neat opportunity for me because I'm very interested in water clarity, particularly interested in the ecology of UV radiation. And you have a situation here in the Great Lakes where there's a lot of increase in water clarity going on. Uh, Hank was a little bit braver than I was in terms of naming the date that we last worked here. I guess that was in a different lab, but uh, it has been a number of years and it's a pleasure to be back here in this context. I do think a lot Okay. All righty, now that I'm unmuted, we'll get going. I want to start out by thanking the number of uh, students, colleagues from really around the world who have helped with the research that I'll be talking about today, particularly my lab manager, Aaron Overholt, who is just really outstanding. And this is a group of my recent students, some of whom have professorships now. Uh, and some who are still in the lab working away. I want to start out with something that I think you're all familiar with, something you can identify with. We all know the sun comes up in the morning. We kind of take it for granted. We also know, for instance, you don't look at the sun directly. And what happens when you go out? What's the problem with being out in the sun? Anything happen when you go out in the sun, spend a day out in the sun? In a single day, the sun can cause severe burns, even blistering going on. Longer term exposure can lead to mutations, skin cancer, cataracts like you see on the bottom left here, pterygium as is very common on the lower right here. Yet, as ecologists, we don't tend to think about it that much. What happens in lakes? Think about zooplankton, highly transparent. Brood carried in, a, in their dorsal pouch here you can die after only, in fact, in less than one full day of exposure. Larval fish die within a day of exposure in the surface waters of a clear water lake. If you take yellow perch eggs and you incubate them at a depth of about 0.8 meters, which at least in some of our lakes, it's a very common depth to see these perch eggs. 
Uh, if they're exposed to UV, they totally perish. If they're not exposed to UV, they're shielded, they develop normally. What happens when you have too little sunlight? Anybody know? What happens if, if humans have too little sunlight? What do you get? Why, why do we want those, in fact, very short wavelength, damaging lengths of radiation? The same ones that damage our DNA help us produce vitamin D. And if you don't get enough sunlight, you have a vitamin D deficiency, you end up with rickets. So the long and the short of the story that you're going to hear today is that with too little UV radiation, this is bad news. With too much UV radiation, this is bad news. And if you're somewhere in the middle, this is just right and we're happy campers. So the focal question I'm going to look at today is whether water, how water clarity alters the physical and chemical structure of lake ecosystems. And what are some of the implications for lake management, whether it be water quality or whether it be fisheries. So we start here in the middle. The lakes that we work on in northeastern Pennsylvania, it's primarily a matter of the lakes are turning browner. And we have two lakes. We have Lake Giles, which is a blue lake, which is turning brown. And we have Lake Lackawack, which is a brown lake that's getting even browner. And we're going to look a little bit at what happens as you get browner. And we're also going to think a little bit about, in the end, how does this apply to the situation in the Great Lakes, where instead of getting browner, there's an increase in transparency. Here, I'm not going to give you any answers. I'm going to ask questions. Because I have not yet worked in the Great Lakes, although I look forward to the opportunity uh, to collaborating with you on this kind of question. In case you don't last the uh, full hour or so, it won't be quite an hour. Uh, here's the take home message. The trophic paradigm is what dominates these days. Nutrients rule. We talk about lakes, are they oligotrophic or eutrophic? How do the nutrients change? How does that influence the chlorophyll? Pretty unidimensional. Years ago, in fact, I've argued, we really need to consider this other dimension, which is dissolved organic matter. As you go from oligotrophic to dystrophic, no change in the nutrients or chlorophyll. Or you go from oligotrophic to mixotrophic, which is both brown and green, and you get higher concentrations of dissolved organic matter. So again, this is the primary message here. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I look forward to somebody coming up, either asking a question afterwards or letting me know. But I don't think the Great Lakes Monitoring Program really is incorporated or thinking much about dissolved organic matter. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to ask a few questions as to why that might be. For example, any of you read this article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel back in June? Used to be a lot of fishing off the breakwater in uh, Milwaukee for yellow perch, and the yellow perch have declined pretty substantially. LOF have declined. There have been a number of changes in the lakes with these changes in transparency. Is it possible that UV has something to do with this? Well, the primary regulator of UV, ultraviolet radiation, is dissolved organic matter. You're all familiar with this. If you drink tea or coffee, it's the brown stuff that leaches out of your coffee or tea. It's the brown stuff that leaches out of leaves on sidewalks. Uh, it results from decomposition, but incomplete decomposition, usually because of low oxygen and then precipitation, which flushes the dissolved organic carbon out of the terrestrial ecosystems and ends up in the lakes. And it can be the primary regulator of water transparency in many lakes, in many natural lake regions, where there's minimal human influence. OK, so that's kind of a whirlwind introduction to the kinds of things we'll be talking about today and what dissolved organic matter is. But let's ask the question, what do we really know about lakes? I would argue that the holy grail of lake management is the chlorophyll-phosphorus relationship. Limnology 101. Closely related is the fact that there's a decrease in secchi depth as you increase phosphorus. So phosphorus rules. Phosphorus controls chlorophyll, algal blooms, secchi depth, transparency. It's really, really key. It's been demonstrated nicely in Lake Washington. When you remove the phosphate from sewage, chlorophyll declines. Tommy Edmondson's nice work back in the 60s, published in 1970. Dave Schindler's work 
whole lake manipulation, you add carbon and nitrogen to one side, no algal bloom, you add phosphorus to that on the other side, and you get a tremendous algal bloom. So again, over and over and over we see this. Lake Erie, no difference. Increase the phosphorus, you get an increase in the chlorophyll. Not exactly a really tight relationship, though this is a log scale. So at any given phosphorus concentration, you have about a tenfold difference, tenfold difference, order of magnitude in chlorophyll. Very real, very compelling, really very satisfying to see that kind of a relationship as an ecologist when systems are so complex. But there's still something more going on, and certainly part of this is the so-called Dreisenid effect that causes a breakdown or decoupling between phosphorus and chlorophyll. But there are other things going on too. And I think, particularly down in this southwestern basin of Lake Erie, where there can be a major DOC plume in addition to nutrients and turbidity, something might be going on there. We'll talk more about that in a minute. In the meantime, we know nitrogen is important too. Can't forget nitrogen. Uh, Jim Elser demonstrated this nicely, looking at hundreds of experiments in terrestrial, freshwater, and marine systems, and found that if you add nitrogen, there's an bump up in the uh, amount of whether, whatever your response for both chlorophyll or productivity. You add phosphorus, there's an increase, but you add both and you get a, a really large increase. Hans Perl found the same thing, looking at whole lake experiments, though about 20 whole lake experiments. If you add phosphorus, you get a response. You add nitrogen, you get a response. But it really takes to, to tango, as he says, much larger response for NP. So this is nothing new. Nutrients are really critical for harmful algal blooms. I don't deny this at all. It's the current paradigm. But we're still talking about an order of magnitude or so variability. It'd be nice to get a little bit more resolution about some of the other things that might be important here, particularly because we're dealing with toxins and things like microcystin and a variety of other uh, toxins, not just liver toxins, but um, potential carcinogens, uh, neurotoxins, and those sorts of things. There's another holy grail, too, I won't spend a lot of time on. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, uh, all based on the food web. Again, a classic paradigm, the trophic paradigm here. And while we know well that nutrients really control algae, uh, zooplankton are also very critical. And if you have high densities of zooplankton, you have fewer algae. Fewer zooplankton, you have more algae. And this is controlled by the number of predators on the top that eat the plankton. So I would say that this is probably the second component or the other holy grail that helps increase the resolution in terms of looking at the response of phytoplankton in a system. The message here, of course, is throw the big ones back. Anyone here know this story, where this picture came from? It went viral a few years ago. Kind of a fun story. <clears throat> nice little fish. The guy who was fishing for it was fishing for northern pike caught a 36-inch pike, 57-inch pike came in and grabbed his 36-inch pike and he landed both of the fish. Fishermen love to tell stories. The fellow who told the story passed away and the real story came out. This is only a 50-inch pike, a real baby, right? <clears throat> Was caught in uh, the Netherlands in 2004. Anyway, it's fun to hear the stories. Not a real story, but the message still holds. Throw the big ones back if you want to help regulate the algae. So given the holy grail of nutrients, how have lakes actually changed in recent decades? It's been many decades now we've recognized this, since the 1960s. Well, nice paper by um, Oliver et al., published in Global Change Biology a couple years ago, looked at almost 3,000 lakes in the Midwest and the Northeast and their conclusion, primary conclusion, was despite large environmental change and management efforts over recent decades, water quality of lakes in the Midwest and Northeast US has not overwhelmingly degraded or improved. There's a really neat animation. I'm not going to show it here because I guess we're uh, online and the animations may give some issues. But uh, if, it's really kind of a fun animation. You can see actively how. Uh, the uh, nutrient and chlorophyll relationship has changed in, in recent years, and the lakes bounce around a bit in the animation. But uh, again, no change in the trend in recent years. 
Okay, so given this stasis in the nutrient chlorophyll relationship, what really has changed in recent years? Has anything changed? Well, don't need to tell you guys, water clarity. So these are lake uh, uh, data from, Great Lakes data from the EPA, worked up by Bo Vanel, thank you Bo. Uh, lake Michigan, uh, Lake Huron, increasing in transparency. Even the eastern basin of Erie and Ontario to some extent, all changing in water clarity. This is a very different situation from what we have in the northeastern United States and what's happening over in northern Europe. What we see in our two primary study lakes, which I'll talk about more as we go on, tell you a little bit more about them. One is a blue lake. I mentioned these at the start. One is a brown lake getting browner. And their clarity is decreasing strikingly. These are 10% photosynthetically active radiation, think visible light depths, have decreased from the order of 14 or 15 meters down to uh, less than, well, maybe six meters or so. Like Lackawack, the Browner Lake, same kind of changes, but not quite as pronounced. And this is a theme we'll see throughout, that the Blue Lake is much more responsive than is the Brown Lake, and there's a good reason for that. And this is due to an increase in this dissolved organic matter that I mentioned before a doubling or so of dissolved organic matter. In many systems, 67% um, of the uh, almost 500 lakes looked at in Scandinavia saw increases in DOM as well, so it's not just isolated to a few lakes. Uh, blue lakes in uh, Maine, same thing, increases in dissolved organic matter, or dissolved organic carbon, which is a, a way to measure the dissolved organic matter. I use the term matter because it includes nutrients. It's not just carbon, although we use DOC as a metric of it. <clears throat> this browning is widespread in northeastern North America. Also across a good part of northern Europe, we're seeing a large number of lakes that are turning brown. Again, in many cases, they are uh, changing by even twofold in the dissolved organic matter concentrations, which is important because that is, in many of these regions, the primary factor controlling water clarity or water transparency. Why? What's going on? What's causing the brownie? Well, there are two causes. One is a good news story. Recovery from acidification, anthropogenic acidification. Sulfate and NOx compounds, which cause sulfuric and nitric acid in the lakes, as the uh, emissions in the Midwest have decreased, or in parts of Europe, industrial Europe, have decreased, and therefore there's a recovery, and this increases the dissolved organic matter production in the soils. And then precipitation, which is increasing, slows down decomposition because you saturate the soils and there's little or no oxygen and you don't get full decomposition to CO2. And then it also washes that into the lakes or into the rivers and into the lakes. <clears throat> so there's uh, a good news and a bad news story. The increased precipitation is part of the climate change story, uh, which, of course, there's a lot of concern about. Other factors are important, too, iron, land use, number of things, but these are really the two big kids on the block in terms of the uh, changes in dissolved organic matter. And you can see this from, from the acid deposition uh, maps of the United States back in 1990 when the Clean Air Act amendments were um, passed. This is hydrogen ion wet deposition. You can see the widespread wet deposition. This little X here in northeastern Pennsylvania is our lake site. Uh, 2014, you can see pronounced decreases in that hydrogen ion deposition. So a real good story, a real success story, where a group of uh, ecologists, biogeochemists, and others um, uh, basically tooted their horns, beat the drums, and there was a response, and the ecosystems are improving. On the other hand, uh, in terms of climate change, there's a real increase in not only average rainfall, so you're probably all aware that warmer air holds more moisture, you get more moisture in the air and you accelerate the hydrologic cycle. You get higher average rainfall, but in particular, we're seeing increases in extreme precipitation events. And this is particularly true in the Northeast where our study lakes are. 71% increase in these extreme precipitation event, uh, events. Defined here as the top 1% of events. Um, this is between 1958 and 2012. This is from the National Climate Assessment. So these two really interact here. In a dry year, this is a paper on 84 lakes in over 30 years in North, uh, northeastern North America by Kristen Strock and others. And in a dry year, you can see that sulfate tends to increase, DOC decreases. 
but in, on average, we're getting wetter, <clears throat> and in wet, wetter years, you get a decrease in that sulfate, much of which was, again, deposited anthropogenically, and you get an increase in the dissolved organic carbon in the lakes. So this is what's going on. That's the framework for browning. That's kind of what's going on with some of the primary causes and the patterns. What, though, are the ecological consequences here that are going on? We're going to take a closer look at our two study lakes in northeastern Pennsylvania to understand what's going on. The Blue Lake, Giles, Brown Lake, Lackawack, turning browner. And these are both under 50 hectares, a little bit smaller than the Great Lakes. And uh, psyche depths in uh, Giles are on the order of six meters plus, uh, used to be much greater. Uh, psyche depth, as I already showed you, psyche depth in Lackawack about three meters. Um, I prefer to use the 1% par depths, 14 meters and six meters or so. And the dissolved organic carbon concentrations are on the range of two or two and a half versus five to six in the Browner Lake. And so what is actually happening in these lakes? Well, dissolved organic carbon concentrations have, again, more than doubled. This is Lake Giles, the Blue Lake. In Lackawack, same pattern, but not quite as strong. The Browner Lake, again, is not responding as strongly as the Clear Lake. pH, dramatic increases in pH. So this is a tenfold decrease in hydrogen ions, full point or more increase in the pH. Same, same kind of pattern in Lackawack. <clears throat> so again, a matter of change in the DOC, but also this is, again, recovery from the acidification, part of the good news story. 10% par depths, I already showed you. Giles, uh, substantial decrease in transparency. Same kind of pattern in Lackawack, but not quite as strong. And interestingly, the chlorophyll has not changed a lot. In the Blue Lake, this is a significant pattern here, but only because it's one last point. So if you look across here, there's not been a strong change in chlorophyll over time. So these changes in transparency, you really can't attribute to changes in chlorophyll in either of those lakes. If anything, in Lackawack, there's a decline going on. So it's not, a, again, one of these things where chlorophyll is regulating transparency, which is part of our classic paradigm that we all like to refer to. Limnological plots here, temperature and oxygen. These are difference plots, though. So this is how the two lakes, the Blue Lake and the Brown Lake, have changed over time. So if you look at the five years surrounding 1990 versus the five years surrounding 2012, the averages here, what you can see in the errors around them, I believe these are standard errors, um, you can see that the surface waters are warming up or have warmed up over this period of 20 years or, or so um, by two degrees or more. Now, interestingly, the air temperature in this region has not changed. We looked at half a dozen different weather stations. We looked at solar radiation. We looked at air temperature. We looked at a variety of different variables. And this is not a climate warming phenomenon. It's due to increases in precipitation. And one of the ways you can see this is you go down deeper in these lakes, and there's a cooling that goes on in the deeper waters, and particularly in Lake Giles, where it's four degrees or so cooler and what's happening is all of that light is being absorbed in the surface waters. So the surface waters are warming and the deeper waters are cooling because not as much light, not as much heat energy gets down to greater depths. Also change in oxygen. The biggest change in oxygen is down deep, particularly in Lake Giles. Substantial decrease, 40% decrease in the percent saturation. And this is largely due to the fact that this used to be the compensation depth, so the 1% par depth, above which there's oxygen generation, below which there's oxygen consumption. And in more recent years, here is the compensation depth. And so we're seeing a decline here in oxygen. And to the point where there used to be supersaturation in the hypolimnion of Giles, and now it's going anoxic because of this change in transparency. Same thing in Lackawack, except a little bit shallower. So again, traditional compensation depth, more recent compensation depth, and a decline of almost 40% in the oxygen, but not at the deepest depths, because of the deepest depths in the already brown lake, it has always been anoxic. 
So there hasn't been a strong change over time. It was anoxic, it still is, but the shallower depths are going anoxic, but not really shallow. The, of course, in the surface mixed layer here, you're seeing um, little or no change. As that oxygen declines in the blue lake, I mentioned it's starting to go anoxic now. It didn't used to go anoxic. It used to be very high oxygen in deep waters. It used to be mosses growing on the bottom, photosynthetic critters. Oh, organisms, sorry. <laughs> Not exactly critters. Now it goes anoxic, and when it goes anoxic, we see a bump up in the phosphorus. These are total phosphorus numbers. So what's happening is as you get anoxic sediments, the phosphorus becomes soluble, comes up into the water column, and causes the potential for a feedback there. And if you think about it, because increased phosphorus can also lead to algal blooms, you get a decrease in transparency even more, which leads to a positive feedback cycle, which would tend to cause even greater oxygen depletion in the deep water. That additional production of carbon, the reduction of light in the deep waters. So there's a positive feedback mechanism there, and it's one of the primary topics of a current NSF LTREB, or Long-Term Research and Environmental Biology project that we have going on in these lakes. Does this make any difference for harmful algal blooms? This is Lake Erie, the western basin. This is a plume of dissolved organic matter coming into the lake, something that, again, as far as I know, people have not really paid much attention to. They talked about primarily nutrients, controlling nutrients, and turbidity to some extent, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but not dissolved organic matter. But if you think about it, dissolved organic matter does contain nutrients, can contribute nitrogen or phosphorus. Well, you'll pick those up in your nutrient analysis, so no great loss there. But other things that dissolved organic matter does is by decreasing water transparency, it also heats the surface waters. And these responses of the lake create nice conditions for cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are favored by warmer surface waters, and this dissolved organic matter, again, is absorbing heat more in the surface waters. There's greater oxygen depletion because of the light not penetrating as deeply. That compensation depth bumps up shallower, as we mentioned and saw in our two lakes in the Poconos. So greater potential for oxygen depletion, which will lead to phosphorus regeneration from the sediments. I think we all know that there have been a lot of uh, deposition of nutrients in that basin of, of Lake Erie in particular. Also, the cyanobacteria can regulate their buoyancy. So in this light-limited environment, they can regulate their buoyancy and have an advantage over other species of algae. So there are a number of different factors uh, that um, DOM change in the lake ecosystem that can contribute to harmful algal blooms. But again, and this is a plea to you guys, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know the literature anywhere near as well as most of you here. But as far as I know, nobody's really looking at dissolved organic matter and how that might influence harmful algal blooms, or in fact, much of anything else in the Great Lakes. Okay, let's take a look at severe storm events. One of the big things going on with climate change, you all know probably 2017, Hurricane Harvey, over a meter of rain in this single event was dumped. Florence in 2018, close to a meter of rain was dumped. This year already, Category 1 hurricane, relatively small in terms of wind force, Barry, uh, relatively recently, dumped uh, close to two feet of rain. And we still have more of the hurricane season to go. It's really uh, just begun. And uh, what happens when you get big rain events is you get real pulses of input of dissolved organic matter into lakes. This is uh, the Manitowoc Min River entering Lake Michigan. And this was a major precipitation event, photograph taken after this major precipitation event in late June of 2011. And this is the peak in the discharge, the hydrograph, showing how this is carrying this dissolved organic matter uh, into Lake Michigan and fundamentally changing the uh, color and the, therefore the properties of the water and most likely how organisms respond uh, to light gradients in the water column. And again, you can see this uh, bloom here, this, in this case from the Maumee River, 
coming into Western Lake Erie and something that, as I argued before, uh, could change things in a fundamental, fundamental way in terms of influencing harmful algal blooms. This is Tropical Storm Irene, 2011, New York City's Ashokan Reservoir. Luckily, they had a weir across here, and they could keep these uh, this huge um, these waters that are loaded with dissolved organic matter and uh, uh, turbi high turbidity out of their drinking water reservoirs. This is one of their drinking water reservoirs, but they were able to keep out the high DOM water. And one of the reasons for this is high DOM water, dissolved organic matter, when you chlorinate it, it produces carcinogenic byproducts that people then would be drinking. This is not good. So dissolved organic matter goes way beyond just the structure and function of ecosystems. It also will reduce the effectiveness of pretty much any disinfection mechanism that you have. And I've attended a few workshops where the city of New York is trying to deal with this and how are we going to avoid exceeding the carcinogenic uh, byproducts in the drinking water due to this increase in extreme storm events. We've looked at data from our own lakes. This is data, or these are data from Lake Giles. This is our blue water lake, and this is the precipitation in millimeters per day because some events will be a huge rainfall in one or two days. Some will be a huge rainfall over a period of a couple of weeks, so we've normalized it per day. And this is the change in the transparency where this dashed line is no change in transparency. And you can see that with an increase in precipitation, uh, again, millimeters per day, you get a decrease in the chance of transparency of up to 7% uh, or so per day. So really substantial changes in the water transparency. And interestingly, when you get to more drought conditions, very little precipitation, we included some points here where there was particularly low precipitation, you get an increase in water transparency. And again, this has to do with the fact that dissolved organic matter is really the primary factor regulating uh, transparency in these lakes. And in most lakes that aren't disturbed by humans, uh, and excessive nutrient overload. You've seen this graph already. This is Lake Giles in Pennsylvania. This is the increased approximate doubling of dissolved organic matter. What I haven't shown you yet is that UV changes too. So these are the 1% depths to which the 320 nanometer, some of the most damaging UV in sunlight penetrates. And it used to be that it went down deeper than 10 meters. And with this increase in the UV absorbing dissolved organic matter, you can see that UV now goes down to even less than two meters in depth in some cases. Again, dramatic decreases in UV transparency. Is this good news or bad news? You guys learn the lesson from the first one that I gave? Going from rickets, vitamin D deficiency, to sunburn? Which would you prefer? Let's take a look at the effects of browning on lakes, which is, again, what we've been focusing on. And the fact that as you get a browner lake, you create a UV refuge. So in a low DOM lake, low DOC lake, the UV will penetrate quite deep in the lake. Lake Tahoe goes down to tens of meters, 30 meters or more. In fact, UVA radiation at times in Lake Tahoe goes deeper than visible light. People don't realize that. A lot of people think, oh, UV, it goes down about this far. But in fact, you get dissolved organic matter and you really create a refuge. It's kind of like the ozone of the underwater world. It absorbs so much UV radiation. And in fact, SOTUS, solar disinfection. In developing countries, one of the best ways to purify your drinking water is to put it in clear bottles and put it out in the bright sunlight and let the UV act on it and it kills most of the microbes. Highly effective, recommended by the World Health Organization. Shows the effectiveness of disinfection the solar disinfecting properties of UV, the beneficial properties of UV. Cincinnati has a UV disinfection facility. Now, actually, many, many cities across around the world, in fact, have this. New York City now has a drinking water UV disinfection facility. One of the primary reasons, well, a couple of reasons. One is, first of all, you don't get the carcinogenic disinfection byproducts produced by chlorinating, although you do have to chlorinate the water before it goes into the pipes for distribution because you don't know it's going to pick up microbes there. There's still a bit of an issue there, but at least it reduces the potential for carcinogenic uh, disinfection byproducts. But it also gets rid of cryptosporidium. And cryptosporidium 
doesn't mind chlorine. And in fact, chlorine can stimulate existment of cryptosporidium, and it doesn't disinfect effectively at all. So you need the UV radiation for this. OK, so dissolved organic matter decreases solar UV inactivation of pathogens. So does. I showed you the water bottles, drinking water bottles out there, the UV disinfection plants. Let's take a look at disinfection. This is modeling disinfection potential, solar inactivation potential, using a DNA action spectrum and UV transparency from lakes that we've sampled worldwide. The first thing you notice is, surprise, surprise, in the northern hemisphere in the wintertime, there's not enough sun to do much solar disinfection. During the summertime, Lake Tahoe in particular, the red line here, there's a lot of disinfection going on. In the southern hemisphere, a couple of lakes that we have here, it's the opposite, of course, because you have um, uh, peak uh, summer solstice is in December, uh, January down there. So uh, what we see, though, is lakes like Tahoe have a very high solar disinfection potential, not likely to have a lot of pathogens in the surface waters of Lake Tahoe. Lake Giles, this is the clear lake, our blue lake, in Pennsylvania back in 1994. It's changed, though, in transparency. You saw the increase in the DOC. It's undergoing browning. Dissolved organic matter is decreasing that solar inactivation potential by about twofold. So that's the reduction in UV transparency and the potential effects on pathogens. What about the influence of this dissolved organic matter and UV on lake ecosystems and some of the critters out there? Well, I already showed you some of the results. You incubate perch eggs at 0.8 meters, a depth they're often found, I'll show you in a minute, in the, in the relative surface waters. And the UV exposed will all die. Those that are not UV exposed develop quite normally. You can see the nicely developing embryos here versus what you have here, the monsters that have died. <clears throat> in these two lakes, there are very different spawning depths. In the brown water lake, Almost all of the perch spawn in the top meter or so, making that incubation of 0.8 meters very realistic. Some spawn down between one and two meters, but nothing below that. Very, very rare to see any eggs below that. In Lake Giles, our blue water lake, you see no eggs in the top meter or two. Once in a while you'll see one, maybe it's been windblown or something happened, but very, very rare. Most of them are down at two or three meters or deeper. Most of them are down, in fact, uh, averages five plus meters depth, so they're spawning much more deeply. I don't know that UV is the explanation for this, but it's an, it's an adequate explanation because we do know that if the yellow perch spawned at the same depth in Lake Giles as they do in Lake Lackawack, they would all die. Changes over time in some of the larval fish. This includes the perch, also some sunfish and bass. Over time, as the lakes have turned brown, these again, it says our brown lake Lackawack and our uh, blue lake Giles, there's been an increase in the catch per unit effort. These are captured in little acrylic minnow traps with light uh, sticks put in them overnight, over a 24 hour period. And the catch per unit effort has increased in Lackawack from 1.6 to 5. In Giles, we never used to catch anything. Couldn't find, we figured there no larval fish. But there have to be because there are some adults there, but not many. And so anyway, the catch per unit effort has increased dramatically over time. Again, I'm not arguing this is all UV radiation, only UV radiation, but it certainly is consistent with the UV damage hypothesis, particularly because if you incubate the eggs in the, at a shallow depth where UV is high and where they spawn, at least in some lakes, uh, they'll all die. Same thing with the larvae. If you incubate the larvae in the surface waters, they'll all die within a day or so in a clear water lake. So they pretty much have to spawn deeper Again, what I haven't done is separate all the other explanatory, potential explanatory factors. It's certainly not due to zooplankton, not an increase in food supply. The, the Daphnia, the calamite copepods, the primary crustaceans in these giles have both decreased significantly. In Lackawack, significant decrease in the calamite copepods. So the fish are not increasing due to increased food supply. In fact, it's more likely that the increase in fish is causing a depression in the zooplankton population. This is one of the things that we're currently trying to sort out with our long-term database, is why do we see these responses in the zooplankton? 
and such strong declines over time. And again, I suspect some of that might be top-down effects of increases in those larval fish. We've also looked at fish in Lake Tahoe, one of the clearest lakes in this country, in fact, one of the clearest lakes in the world. And although there are many, many that rival it, particularly some of the high elevation alpine lakes in snow-covered, rock-covered uh, habitats. But Lake Tahoe is one of the best known. Sand Harbor here, highly transparent. Just down the lake is, uh, across the lake is Star Harbor, which is very high dissolved organic matter. And in fact, you tend to find invasive warm water fish in these brown harbors. And we looked at this a little more closely. The bluegill and largemouth bass are the two warm water invasives in the lake. Mahontan red sides are the native fish that are eaten by these invasive species. And you can notice a little bit more pigmentation in the Mahontan red side here. And what we did was to test the UV tolerance of these two invasive species and of the native species. And this is the UV exposure level and this is the mortality rate. And what you can see is the invasive species, both the bluegill and the largemouth bass, 99% mortality between one and two kilojoules per meter square, as opposed to the native species, the hunt and red sides, the 99% uh, lethal exposure level was 13 or so. So more than six times as high. And so certainly, it seems like, again, we haven't sorted out all the different factors going on here. There certainly are many other things. There might be a greater food supply here. There might be a refuge from predation. But UV alone seems to be an adequate explanation because the uh, Lahontan red side lives uh, very nicely out in this habitat. Uh, the invasive species only tend to occur and nest in these higher dissolved organic matter harbors. What about mosquitoes? Yellow fever mosquitoes, Asian tiger mosquitoes, vectors of Zika, dengue, a variety of other viruses. They're subtropical species. And as you may be aware, they're spreading northward, including into the United States. And this is the Center for Disease Control range maps for where these two species can uh, potentially exist, where the conditions are adequate. And the attention here has been largely focused on the fact that there's a warming going on, and therefore subtropical species can expand north. But maybe there's something else going on here, too, in addition to warming. There's an increase in precipitation going on, especially the uh, extreme events that bring more dissolved organic matter into these systems, and that would tend to provide a UV refuge for mosquito larvae. Mosquito larvae have breathing siphons. They have to stay up at the very surface of the water, potentially exposed to very high solar radiation. So in a high UV system like this, here are the mosquito larvae. This is a pupa in between them with their breathing siphons up here. They have to be up near the surface. And so the working hypothesis here in looking at this was that they are going to be damaged by UV and never emerge as adults, as opposed to in a system where there's higher dissolved organic matter and a UV refuge, there will be successful emergence to adults. And therefore, these increases in dissolved organic matter might be augmenting the ability of these mosquito larvae, these um, invasive disease vectors, to spread in the United States. So we tested, are they susceptible to solar UV radiation? And these are survivorship rates in the presence of UV and the absence of UV in an incubation apparatus where we control the temperature. One of my students who helped with these experiments. And we find a much lower survivorship in the presence of UV. Notice that there's not 100% survivorship even when UV is shielded. And one of the things we think is going on here is that the blue light, in fact, there's a lot of blue light that's also damaging. There's a recent study that has shown that blue light also can be damaging. So in the solar, we had high levels of blue light. It, when we went into the lab and used an artificial UV lamp, we found that in the absence of dissolved organic matter, there was close to 100% survival. And in the presence of UV, and this is UV that mimics about a day exposure in the field, but doesn't have the really high blue light that you have in sunlight. And you see 
no survivorship at all in the presence of UV, unless you add dissolved organic matter, in which case you get a very high survival of the mosquito larvae. And it turns out the mosquitoes prefer habitats that are shaded either by trees in the woods, for example, or by high concentrations of dissolved organic matter, which I'm guessing, I don't have the measurements, but in the small ponds where mosquito breed are likely increasing as they are in lakes and as they are in rivers. So again, I think this may, might be a major contributing factor. So just as with humans, where too little UV can be damaging, no vitamin D, or too much can lead to sunburn, cancer, cataracts, all kinds of problems, and there's a just right healthy in the middle, I think the same thing is true with UV radiation. If there's too little UV, there's no solar disinfection, so you can get high concentrations of pathogens. Vectors of disease, like mosquitoes, will not be controlled. Invasive species, warm water species, can invade cold water, clear water lakes if there's too little UV present. If there's too much UV, you get sunburn and you get death, whether it be fish eggs, fish larvae, whether it be zooplankton, no matter what it be. And there's an intermediate level. Now, we're obviously imposing our human values on this system. Uh, and uh, you know, that's kind of the perspective, though, that we have when we consider uh, managing lakes. But again, there are beneficial and detrimental effects of UV. Most of us think of UV as damaging. You think about sunburn. You think about uh, cataracts. You think about sun cancer, uh, skin cancer. But uh, there actually are some real beneficial things with UV as well. Uh, good reason to have clear water. So that's all I'm going to give you in terms of answers. Now what I'm going to do is ask some questions. And this deals with the Great Lakes, where, again, I have no experience. I've looked at some of the data. I'm actually very fascinated. Again, I'm really pleased to be here talking to you because I want to learn more about them. Because we have a situation here where there's an increase in the almighty Seki depth. I hope you guys are at least, in fact, I know you guys are at least looking at par now rather than just Seki depth. Uh, it's amazing, though, how many people still use just Seki depth to look at water transparency and get so much more information from a submersible radiometer and preferentially with a UV sensor on it because UV has something to do with what goes on in underwater environments. Maybe I haven't convinced you, but I'm certainly convinced myself. Anyway, we get systems that are increasing transparency here. What about Lake Michigan? And again, I asked this question already, so I'm kind of repeating what I set up in the beginning. Is there some role for UV in these decreases in yellow perch in Lake Michigan? Used to be many, 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 many yellow perch, and now they're essentially disappearing. Other fisheries are changing as well. Alewife are declining, uh, and there might be something going on here. And even in Lake Erie, now, there are increases in transparency to some extent in the eastern basin, but in the western basin of Lake Erie, central basin, very little change in transparency. Over time, long-term trends, Secchi depth, the real nice depth in UV and PAR profiles, and I believe Hank, at least, is doing some work on this already. Uh, I think it'd be wonderful and more insightful to look at some something beyond that, particularly given this plume of dissolved organic matter that uh, breaks up and certainly will change the characteristics of Western Lake Erie and potentially alter uh, the response of harmful algal blooms uh, may also alter yellow perch uh, recruitment. Um, there's been some nice work, a couple of studies recently uh, that have shown that if you're inside this plume, the number of larval yellow perch is much higher than outside the plume. And you might say, well, of course, there are a lot of nutrients there, right? It's part of the nutrient chlorophyll paradigm. There's more nutrients, there's more food. But this study showed zooplankton food resources were similar inside and outside the plume, did not explain these differences in distribution. And furthermore, the growth rates were similar or perhaps even higher outside the plume. So why is it we get more inside the plume? Well, I'm not real comfortable saying it was UV radiation, but you know, particularly like Erie, UV doesn't penetrate all that far, I'm sure. We don't, again, have too many measurements. But some fish are positively phototactic. And so in regions of lake without high DOM, with lower DOM, if they're attracted to light and up to those top centimeters of the lake, there certainly could be UV exposure levels 
that are potentially hazardous. I call this the solar ambush hypothesis. The idea is they can't detect and avoid UV, but they're positively phototactic, so if they get up into a high UV environment, they don't know it, but it ruins their DNA and they're dead. So anyway, that is one possible explanation. Again, I'm, you have to have this positive phototaxis and differential response to UV and PAR. We just don't know. Again, I'm not saying this is the answer, but it's something that hasn't been looked at. Um, this group, Reichert et al., uh, tried to explain this in terms of predation, which is very logical. It's part of the Holy Grail, right? Part two of the Holy Grail is that uh, predation, top-down, effectively regulate what's going on. And that may indeed be the answer, but I think UV at least deserves a look because you've got this large plume there, and I've already covered this as well, uh, This uh, in these increases in dissolved organic matter. Do they have a role in the harmful algal blooms here? As far as I know, nobody's really looking at that. But there are all kinds of reasons from nutrients to water transparency to the heating of the waters, the buoyancy, of the cyanobacteria, the greater oxygen depletion, the phosphorus regeneration, changing the light environment, that dissolved organic matter is likely playing some kind of a, an important role there. Never mind the production of toxins, which we really don't understand yet. If anybody has the answer to this, let me know. But why is it that sometimes the cyanobacteria produce toxins and other times they don't? It doesn't seem to be just nutrients. It doesn't seem to be nutrient ratios. We kind of suspect there's some, some evidence that nitrogen plays a role but we don't, I don't think, really have the answer yet. Again, if somebody has the answer, please let me know. I'd love to know it. Just this year, Journal of Great Lakes Research, there was a study by Justin Chafin and others. Is he here by chance? I don't know him. Again, I'm not familiar with this group. Uh, anyway, maybe some of the co-authors are here. But the conclusion here was because larger biomasses of this Dolichospermum, which is one of the toxin-producing cyanobacteria, used to be anaphena, were observed in summers with reduced water clarity, lake managers should consider minimizing sediment loads into the central basin of Lake Erie in addition to nutrient load reduction. So somebody's finally recognizing that, you know, maybe it's not just nutrients. Maybe it has something to do with transparency. Sediment loads in the central basin, uh, maybe. But that's a long distance out to the central basin. I'm guessing most of the sediments have settled out. And it may be more dissolved organic matter that's playing a role there than anything. But as far as I know, nobody's looking at dissolved organic matter, either the quantity or the quality. So I think it's worth a look. <coughs> Excuse me. So back to the take-home message here. Here's the classic paradigm. Is the lake oligotropic, mesotropic, eutrophic? Where does it fall on this gradient of nutrients and chlorophyll? Let's see if we can get beyond this. Let's see if we can incorporate dissolved organic matter into this paradigm, look at dystrophic, mixotropic conditions, how the light environment changes, and the many other ways that dissolved organic matter may alter the ecology of lakes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd be happy to take questions. Hey, Craig, this is Rose. Hey, Rose. Hey, great talk. Um, um, <clears throat> I have a number of questions, probably too many, so I'll follow up with you. <laughs> happy later. to talk to anybody afterwards, too. So um, uh, my colleagues and I are working on dissolved organic matter in Lake Erie, and particularly its role in the harmful algal blooms and even more specifically in the formation of the, uh, the toxin-forming um, blooms. So, Maybe we'll have an answer eventually. But um, it does seem that dissolved organic matter photochemistry may be important, um, which is what we're looking at. So I wanted to follow up on that. And, and so um, I'm going to ask a number of questions that might seem unrelated, but it's all related in my brain. Yep, yep. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Rose, I am aware that you're studying dissolved organic matter here. <clears throat> and I've seen a couple of your papers. But as far as I know, the, the monitoring efforts that are ongoing by the larger groups are yeah. not looking at the dissolved organic matter, in spite of the fact that you've identified, uh, identified some potential. Yeah, areas. and that's that's a that's really important because if we figure out that it is important, we we could then look back in time because we can calculate. So we're looking at whether uh, photochemical production of hydrogen peroxide or reactive oxygen species is influencing things. So 
we have now really good information on the controls on those rates by dissolved organic matter. So if we had the monitoring data, we could go back in time or forward in time. But so with that um, said, so I was curious with your, your, the lakes that you're working on in Pennsylvania where you're seeing the browning, and you showed the change in the oxygen um, uh, concentration, I think, uh, uh, with respect to a long-term average. Have you calculated or estimated how much the dissolved organic matter photochemistry could contribute to that change in the oxygen concentration in the surface? Um, I'm not... Uh looked at the photochemistry relative to oxygen depletion, but we've looked at the relative importance of um, photodegradation versus biodegradation. And consistent with the results that you found in the Arctic, uh, photodegradation seems to be much more important than uh, biodegradation, at least in the surface waters. And in fact, uh, a colleague just sent me a manuscript, a colleague and, and a student of mine, Jenny Bredentrop, I think you may know, uh, sent me a manuscript that resolves that at multiple depths and attempts to, attempt, attempts to model um, over time whether photodegradation uh, integrated over the water column plays a, a larger or smaller role. I suspect that uh, most of the photodegradation is occurring in the surface waters, and uh, the depth of the epilimnion might be on the order of three or four, five, six, seven meters, depending on the time of year and that there is not a lot of oxygen depletion due to that photodegradation because those key wavelengths are um, not reaching the depths where it's sealed off. There's a lot of potential for oxygen regeneration in the, in the surface water. So I don't think it's, I, I don't believe it's going to be playing a large role in the decline in the oxygen in the deeper waters, but I do believe that it's a major contributor. In fact, from our data, it's, it seems like it's the major contributor to the photodegradation of that dissolved organic matter, rather than microbial, which again is a traditional paradigm yeah. that uh, people have uh, said over and over and over again, but not many people, other, yourself again being one of the exceptions, critically tested it quantitatively. Well, that's, I'm really excited to see her paper, but I, I'm, I, would, I would be really curious to, to just know what the oxygen consumption rates are relative to the rate of regeneration from, from this surface, in part because this relates to my next question, in terms of um, the UV refuge with high dissolved organic matter. So it's a, so there's a UV refuge, but is there a refuge from reactive oxygen species? And so if you have high dissolved organic matter, you have a really high rates of photodegradation, which is exactly what your student is showing that we've been working on as well. And so you have really high rates of, say, for example, hydrogen peroxide production, which brings it full circle and I'm done now. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, um, as, as you know, because you've had ex some experience on this panel as well, our United Nations panel, the EAP, has been wrestling with that question, and what's the relative importance of the reactive oxygen species versus the UV damage itself? And it seems that the DNA damage rates from this, trying to parse it out mostly from some studies that were done over in, in Europe, uh, looking at the DNA damage rates uh, and the mortality rates uh, and potential damage of reactive oxygen species, it's really in the top few centimeters that you're going to tend to get that uh, damage. I, I don't think it's a closed book, though. I think it's still very much an open question, but I do know that uh, when you incubate a whole variety of organisms, we've done many, 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 over 40 different species, in the presence and absence of dissolved organic matter and expose them to UV, that the dissolved organic matter controls are generally very, very high. You saw the example of the mosquito larvae here. There's a real rebound. So it doesn't seem that the mortality rates from the reactive oxygen species are, are in the presence of DOM are greater than the DNA damage and membrane damage and other biochemical damage. So that, again, we've seen that over and over and over again in the results that dissolved organic matter is really protective and really does good things to organisms rather than bad. And if it was, in fact, reactive oxygen species that are doing the damage from UV exposure, we would, wouldn't expect that result. Are so high is because you have all that dissolved organic matter uh, absorbing light producing the reactive oxygen species, but then the dissolved organic matter itself is the sink, and it's getting oxidized in the process. So that's, I, I think that it probably is the direct UV damage. Uh, um, that's more important, but I'm just curious. 
what, if you had any more evidence for that. Yeah, again, the number of experiments we've done where we've manipulated DOM and UV with many kinds of organisms, it's pretty rare that we see a positive response in UV. There are one or two exceptions. Sandra Cook, one of my PhD students, did some experiments a while ago with some of the adaptive and copepods that have high concentrations of kind of carotenoids and microsporine like amino acids, which are potent antioxidants, and they actually seem to do better sometimes with UV exposure. And again, we never figured out the answer to why that is, but there's some hint, but that's, again, you know, 1% of the experiments. And I'd be happy to talk after. Yes. So I think spring nutrient export is a good predictor of harmful algal blooms in the summer. Um, but discharge is the best predictor. And so I'm wondering if that's sort of more evidence that it's actually DOM that has some kind of role to play because DOM usually responds more strongly to nutrients to discharge. That's a really interesting thought. And I'm not much of a hydrologist, but I see exactly the point you're making. And I think we could parse something out, especially if we had some DOC measurements. And if you had yeah, those data, have the data, I would love to either know the answer or help you work through them. Because, because that's, <laughs> that's really that's a fascinating thought. I hadn't realized that discharge yeah, that is a just... better predictor of the blooms. And that would, in fact, yes, interesting, interesting. Yeah, again, if you have any leads on that, let me know, because that's the kind of thing that you want to be examining. Uh, just for, for your in, in information, uh, uh, immediately following the seminar, Craig will be uh, available uh, in this room and then in the Lake Ontario room for uh, an hour or so. So if any of you want to talk with Craig in uh, detail, about your particular re research uh, questions, uh, you, you may uh, uh, meet with him uh, considerably later than the seminar. Any other questions? No, I'm giving you a workout. Hi, I'm Brent Lofgren. I'm the climate guy here. Oh, good. Uh, uh -oh. Yeah. And, uh oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you're talking about the uh, near surface temperatures of, of the uh, lakes that you were studying, uh, right. you you said you looked at air temperature and uh, solar radiation. I'm wondering if you looked at long wave radiation, which is what really stands at the root of anthropogenic climate change. Good point. Did not look at that. Yeah. Did not look at that. Yeah. So we do um, have some data on long wave radiation. Actually, I. I don't know that we looked at it. My PhD student is the one who did the research into it, but I will I will ask her about that. But mm -hmm. wouldn't you expect if long wave radiation were changing, the air temperature would change as well? It'd be pretty. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm working on a book that is aimed at uh, a combination of climate change impact researchers and general public. And one of the points I'm I'm really trying to make in there is that people uh, tend to understand things from a weather perspective as the, the atmosphere is driving everything, whereas at a climatic time scale, things are much more driven by interactions between the atmosphere and the surface, whether it's water or land. So that's a lot of people have made mistakes surrounding that, I think. Well, what we did was to find every possible kind of data that would suggest that temperature was a driver change in climate, weather conditions that you can get from uh, weather stations sprinkled around the area, a variety of them. And uh, there was no evidence at all, no relationship between, or no trend over that time period. But there was a very, very strong trend in precipitation. I didn't show it here. Uh, average on order of, um, a meter of rain to 1.4 meters over that same time period. And a dramatic increase in dissolved organic carbon dramatic in, in quantity of it and the quality of it too. It's darker carbon. And I think the real clincher for me is the cooling of the deeper waters that accompany the warming of the shallow waters. And you can't explain that on uh, based on long wave radiation alone. Right. Yeah. So I'm not I, saying long I, wave didn't play a role. Right. I, I, I should have actually started out by saying I think you're you're probably right, but 
for the sake of completeness. Yeah, yeah. and you know, again, it might be that my PhD student was able to get some data on long wave. I know that one of my colleagues was measuring long wave on one of the lakes there. And whether we looked at those data or not, we, we looked at everything because we couldn't believe that it hadn't changed. Because our sense was that this is changing everywhere. But once you look at maps and you know it's not changing everywhere. Heterogeneous responses geographically. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. And we're happy to talk to anybody with more questions individually.